Good evening, good evening to each and every one of you. This is uh, Pastor Hurt again. We welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. I want to thank you again. I don't think that I can say it enough. Thank you for uh, your prayers, uh, not just for me, for the ministry and for each of those of us in the body of Christ. Continue to do that. Thank you for your support, tuning in for our broadcast. We do our best to, uh, to be led of the Lord, to give you something that can speak to you, uh, that is relevant to your situation right now, that you might hear word from the Lord. And so we encourage you to continue to lift us up, that God may continue to strengthen us and use us, that he may speak to the body as a whole. And so continue to tune in on Wednesday night for our Bible studies. Also, I want to thank those of you who are now joining us on our uh, what we call lunch hours on Wednesday at 12 noon. Amen. I know a number of you can't tune in, but certainly uh, the broadcast typically is made available afterwards. And so you can watch it at a later time. But for those of you who have been tuning in, thank you so much. And like you have done with our uh, Sunday morning worship, as well as our Wednesday night Bible study, we're going to ask that you will share it. Share it with your friends and your family so that we may expand our footprint. And so we thank again all of our brothers and sisters that are also tuning in from Africa, from South Africa, Uganda, Kenya, uh, and even Haiti. So wherever you are uh, looking at us, I want you to know how appreciative I am. Continue to do that. Continue to tune in. And certainly we will continue to pray for you and your ministry. And we pray the will of God is perfected in your life. But before we go into the study of the word of God tonight, uh, as we customarily do, let us pause and uh, let us just pray. And so I invite you to pray uh, and simply uh, open your mouth right where you are and whatever the Holy Spirit has put upon your tongue. We're going to ask that you can uh, declare that in the atmosphere even now while I'm praying. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. God, we thank you for this privilege to come before your presence, God, and that we may gather together again in study of your word. Father, we thank you that you woke us up. We thank you that you kept us, Lord God, and that you continue to bless us as a people. Gracious Father, we pray that you will place us on one accord, uh, that God, that everything that is done will be pleasing in your sight. God, be magnified. Get all of the honor and all the glory because you are worthy of the praise. Father, when we consider all that you have done, all that you are, Father, we can't help but give you praise. And so, God, be exalted in each family that is watching here, each individual. God, be exalted in our lives. God, let your divine will be done. God, we thank you, Lord God, that you are yet teaching us how to be people of faith how we can trust you, Lord God, and how we can go forth in the confidence uh, that you have a plan for our life and that you, God, have a, a plan to bless us, that you will have an expected end for our life. And God, we thank you. Help us to trust that. Help us, Lord God, uh, to be faithful individuals. And so, Father, we pray uh, for our brothers and our sisters, our seniors, to the youngest one, God, who are going through various health challenges and tribulations. God, those who are experiencing mental health challenges, God, those who are affected by the COVID virus and other things that may have come upon their bodies. Father, we lift them up right now in the strong name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Father, we pray that you will bring healing, that you will be merciful, God, because we know sickness is not of thee. And so, God, we ask, God, according to our faith, God, these who are called by your name, we are petitioning you and asking, God, in the name of your son, Jesus, Yahshua the Christ, that you will bring healing, that your blessings will be upon them, and that peace, God, will prevail. Father, we ask it in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. It is always a privilege to pray to be in the presence of the Almighty God that we may uh, gather together or whether you're praying individually, let prayer be the order of the day. I like saying that phrase. Let it be something that you customarily do and not something that you have to kind of remind yourself to do. That is a part of who you are. Talking to God is a part of who you are. When you wake up in the morning, let's have that conversation. And as you go throughout the day, uh, then let's develop the practice of having a conversation with the Almighty God. And certainly before you close your eyes in the evening, uh, you ought to do the same. And again, I want to uh, extend to those of you who have not been a part of our prayer. Our prayer gathering each uh, weekday morning at 6 a.m., Monday through Friday. We invite you to call in and join in with us as we cover each other in prayer. And uh, we're praying for you. And we pray that you are praying for us as well. But you can come and tune in with us on the prayer call line that we may pray collectively. And then we thank you for those who are tuning in uh, on uh, Tuesday night, Monday night, Thursday night, and Friday night for our 6 p.m. Zoom. 
And so we appreciate those of you who have been faithful in that, uh, that we can see one another and just kind of fellowship. It's an opportunity while we're yet still in this COVID uh, situation where we can stay connected with one another. And so if you've not been a part of that, you're welcome to be a part of our evening Zoom. That information is also available, not just on our website, uh, but certainly here on uh, our Facebook and YouTube site. And so it's always, always in the announcements. And so we welcome you to be a part of that experience. Well, tonight we're going to pick up from where we were at on Sunday. On Sunday, we talked about lessons from a storm, lessons from a storm. I pray that the word of God on Sunday blessed you richly. I pray that you have been in the presence of the Almighty God and that God revealed some things to you, that God is yet working and strengthening some things in your life. I pray that you went back and look at uh, the scriptures that were captured in Mark 4, which we're getting ready to read. Or the same story also, you might prefer it, uh, the version of it that is in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, either way, amen, put it in your spirit, get it in your heart, uh, that it may continue to speak to us because we know uh, that life always, always brings series of storms. And so understanding why the storms come, understanding what the storms are about uh, is essential for our faith development. And so I hope that you've already gleaned that understanding. If not, as we go forth tonight, we're going to continue to emphasize those points and make sure that we are purposeful uh, in making sure that we help the body of Christ to know uh, that God is in the business of developing our faith so that his name might be exalted and his presence might be carried wherever we go so that all of his creation, like the, the birds and the bees and the animals and everything else that he has created, that mankind will know how to bring glory unto the Most High God and that we can carry ourselves in such a way uh, that we're not only carrying the image of God, but certainly uh, we are bringing glory unto him. And so I'm going to be reading from the whole men's Christian uh, version, and that's Matthew chapter 4, verse number 35, and we're going to conclude with verse number 41. Okay, let's, if you have your Bibles and your pens and your paper, go ahead and get that so that you might uh, take some notes as some things are spoken to you and uh, that you can further follow up on it and see what God would give you uh, in a deeper understanding. So Mark 4, beginning at verse 35, it says, On that day when the evening had come, he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. And so they left the crowd and took him along since he was already in the boat. And other boats were with him. And a fierce windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already been swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. I got to read that again. But he was in the stern, that's Jesus, sleeping on a cushion. And so they woke him up and said unto him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? What a question. Don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then he said unto them, I want you to hear this question because this question is still being asked of us today. Why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? Why are you fearful if if God is your source, if God is your savior, if God the Father is the one that you understand have already given you the victory, then why are you fearful? He says, do you still have no faith? Two great questions. Why are you fearful? And do you still have no faith? And as they were terrified and asked one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey? What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story. Amen. Wonderful story. You know, I, I love reading this story because it helps me to understand uh, that life is purposeful, right? And that there are things that come uh, in our lives that are intentional by God so that he, that he can continue to develop us personally. And that even as we are being developed personally, we can collectively, through our varied experiences, we can come together like a church family or 
however you are gathered in the name of the Lord, and we can do a wonderful work on behalf of the kingdom because we have been developed and we have uh, we have gone through or yet going through the maturing process. And so it's about doing that, right? I, I can only imagine what a world would look like even the more if all of those who call upon the name, the name of the Lord uh, are matured in God. And we understand that trouble comes our way and we understand that sickness come our way and we understand that a number of adverse events will come our way, but that's not the time for us to lose our faith. That, that, that our response is not to become unraveled and unglued, so to speak, but that we recognize that God has a purpose and a plan for everything. And that my, my commitment is this, that I understand that no matter what I am facing, I trust God. I, no matter where I'm going, what I'm going through, I trust God. And so I pray that, that that's also your conviction. Uh, this particular story that we have read from 35 to 30 uh, through 41, Mark places it uh, following what we know to be the, uh, the parables. Uh, in Mark's version, he focused on the teaching that Christ was doing and not so much on the healing and the other things that were taking place. We understand that there was a crowd of people that were following uh, Jesus Christ by this time. He had already began to reveal who he was in terms of the feeding of the thousands, as well as the miracles of giving sight to the blind and, and, and causing the lame to walk. There were so many things that have already taken place. And so the fame of the Messiah had been going forth for a while now, by the time this story takes place. And so he's teaching them about the sower. And that's a wonderful parable. And we've, we've, we've preached that many times here at Emmanuel. But I want to make sure that I, that I encourage you to go back and look at it again. Because we understand that we are called to understand what the Word of God is. The Word is the seed. It is the seed that we are called to plant in the hearts of people as the Holy Spirit give us guidance. And he directs our path. And so as we speak the Word of God, as we teach the Word of God, we have an expectation or the hope, rather, that it will hit a, a good soil in the side, inside the ones that we're talking about, right? We know that sometimes when the word of God is going forth, that the enemy takes it right away before it even have an opportunity to take root. And then we know that when the word of God comes, some people are, are glad to receive it. They receive it, they identify with Christ, but yet when they began to become persecuted as a result of this commitment, this newfound relationship with Jesus Christ, there are many people who will renounce Christ. They'll go back to the old familiar. They walk away from the faith. And then there are those who are even more genuine in their receptive uh, receptiveness of the word of God. And they receive the word of God, but life happens. They are so much preoccupied with what is happening around them, perhaps on the news and, and the, the fearful things that we see with our eyes, that it began to not develop their faith, but it begins to choke the faith. You know, they're so concerned about uh, uh, catching up with the Joneses, so to speak. They want to be everything that the world has to offer them. And so they're involved in everything to the degree that they are neglecting their personal growth and their spiritual growth. And so sometimes the word of God is just simply choked out of us because we don't have enough space in our hearts and our mind for the Lord God because everything that is in our minds and in our tongue is secular. Everything is from, from the world and not of the kingdom. And so we need to make sure that we're aware of that. And so we need to, it's all about having balance and moderation. I'm not going to spend the time talking about what you should and should not do, but I will encourage you that if you are sincere about your relationship with the, with the Almighty, Father, as well as growing, that you need to place a premium on that. You need to make it a priority that you will spend your time, as we stated, even at the uh, concluding of last year and the beginning of this year, you spend your time in meditation. You spend your time in, in prayer and in study of the Word of God. You spend your time learning scriptures because it's about you and I becoming stronger. It's about you and I uh, hearing clearer the voice of God, that we may navigate through this life as a vessel called of God and as an ambassador of the kingdom of the Most High. I want us to understand what it is that God has called us to be and what he has empowered us to do. And so that's that's what life's about. And so Mark, he, he spends time sharing this particular story. And then it gives us a little insight that even though Christ at this time that he was walking the earth and teaching, he often spoke in parables so that those who would be uh, uh, born into the kingdom of God, that it will have to be caught uh, spiritually or supernaturally. All right. So sometimes people cannot grasp parables, even though they may use earthly example, but typically they have spiritual meaning and not everybody have that kind of insight unless the Holy Spirit reveals. 
And so we are grateful that the Holy Spirit reveals even today and that the Holy Spirit uh, have uh, revealed some things in your heart that you can understand that has absolutely changed your life. And you know that you are who you are right now because the Holy Spirit reveals some truth. You applied those truths, and then those truths came to flourishing in your life. And so I, I just want to thank God for that. If that's your experience, I thank God that you, like me, as well as others of us who have many of those kinds of experience, and that is what the journey is all about. And so Mark places this story at the conclusion of Christ spending time speaking in parables to, uh, to the people who were following him. Uh, it was a mass following him. He was speaking in parables about the kingdom. We know that when Christ began his, his teaching, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we know that the kingdom is the central theme for why Christ came, to present the authority of God and the presence of God in a fallen world, and to, that we can know and understand that it doesn't have to continue to be our narrative or our reality, but that you and I can have a new reality, and that is one of being born again in the Most High God as well as being used of God to do His bidding, that we may carry the presence of God on, on the earth and that we may lift up the name of God with our life and how we live it, right? And so the fruits of our lift that we will give sacrifice and praise unto the Lord God, as well as our lives need to speak of our commitment to uh, to the Almighty Father. And so he does that. But then in, in teaching the disciples, aside from the masses, the Bible tells us, Mark tells us that uh, once they left the group, that Jesus would be intentional in helping to explain the parables. Because these gentlemen, these 12 would be, uh, at least 11 of them would be the, the vehicle that God would use to advance his kingdom, right? They will be what, what, what we call constitute the church, right? The, the first church. And so these individuals would be given a task. And each of them will be placed in situations where their very lives will uh, be taken as a result of this call. And so if you understand that, if you haven't had the chance to do that, read how each of the apostles were called. And so now God is at almost towards the end of the three and a half years of teaching them. And he has been perfecting them and trying to get them to really understand in their heart who he is. You get glimpsed when you read the stories, the various stories, that there are times where it looked like they absolutely know who Christ is. And then there are times where you were like, wow, how can you be around him watching all of those miracles and see him doing all of those things and not have a resolve in your heart that without a doubt, I know him to be the Messiah. I know him to be uh, the Adonai. I know him to be the anointed one, the Christ. I know him to be the one that was prophetically spoken of, that he may take away the sins of the world. And so sometimes when you read uh, the stories about the disciples, it seems like they have that conviction. But more often than not, as we see in this particular example, they don't. You know, despite what had just happened and despite what they were exposed to, they still were wrestling with whether or not is he authentically who he declares himself to be. And so we need to make sure that we understand that because it may be the reality that we are facing and we just not really haven't figured out why we are wrestling in the way that we are. We all have to grow into a place where we trust God. He either is going to be God or not. He's either Christ or not. You know, we can't vacillate back and forth, but we need to be consistent in what we declare where we place our faith. And so I just wanted to state that while it was on my heart, we need to make sure that we know that. So let's look at uh, what took place. All right. So after he did uh, the teaching, the uh, Mark tells us, he says, on the day when the evening had come, all right, he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. And so... Uh, he said, let's go over to the other side of the sea because uh, we have other work to be done. And the crowd was, uh, was still there and it was evening time. But I love the fact that Mark points out, as well as Matthew, that Jesus was already in the boat when he told the disciples, come on, let's go to the other side. And for me, I know we can make things out of things that may not necessarily be speaking that, but it, when I read this, um, you know, a few weeks ago when I was looking at this, and I don't know if I looked at it uh, before or recognized it in the way that I'm getting ready to expound upon it. It says that, uh, so they left the crowd and they took him along since he was already in the boat. What struck me is this, is that oftentimes when God is calling us, we forget the fact that he's already gone where he's asking us to go. I love the fact that Mark takes the time to say that Jesus was already in the boat. He called for them, come, 
Let's go to the other side. But he showed by example that I'm with you. I'm here. I'm not going to send you there by yourself. And we do know that there's at least one story where Christ sent them across with the same purpose. The same purpose of teaching them how to trust in him. He sent, in this particular story, he sent them over and then a storm arose when they were about part way through. But in that story, Christ came walking on the sea. And if you're familiar with that story, then you know that fear also arose in them. And they thought it was some kind of ghost. Even still, they were not able to comprehend that it was Christ. It was Yahshua that was walking on the water. And so now we find a lesser story in the sense that because Christ is with him. He's not asking them to go to the other side. He's in the boat. He's in the boat with him, and he says, let's go over to the other side. And we're not given all of the pieces of the story, but I love the fact that not long after, you know, we find Christ sleeping. You know, he's sleeping uh, on the cot, if you will, on the cushion in the back. And so he says to them, come on, let's, let's get in the boat. We got to go to the other side, so to speak. But then in verse 37, it says that a fierce windstorm arose, and then the waves began to take over the boat. Now, that's the thing that I want to make sure that I, that I elaborate on because this wind seemed to be sudden, right? The wind seemed to be sudden. We know that, that now because we have the advantage of hindsight, we know that this whole process is about God developing the faith of the disciples, right? Faith provides the necessary conviction for us to flow in the ordinary events of life. I wrote some things down that I want to put out before you, that faith provides the necessary conviction for us. It is essential that our faith grows. And so God has to be intentional in allowing us to experience certain things in life that we might grow, that we might learn from it. Yeah, you might fail. Most likely all of us fail. We may fail several times, right? But because we are righteous and we are right with God, we get back up and recognize that that's not the end of things. God is still teaching. God is merciful. He's a teacher that is patient. God recognizes that there is some learning that need to take place. And so the best way that I know to learn is to do it by trial and error. You, you experience it. So, uh, so our faith is developed by the fact that we are there. And why? Because God wants these ordinary events, these ordinary storms that he allows to varying degrees to come into our life to get us at some point in time where we can do the extraordinary where we can be a people that, that is used of God in such a way that it will convict the lives and the hearts of those who are watching the work of God in our life. Our faith is perfected through our practice, right? Our faith is perfected through our practice. Our practice of what? Our everyday application of what it is that God has called us to do, right? The word of God. We put the practice, right? We speak it, right? We live it. We become it because the more that we understand it, the more that we speak the word of God, then our faith is developing. It is increasing, right? And so that's the only way that I know. I wish I can tell you that your faith can be increased uh, any other way, but that's not the way God's so fit to do that. And so we have to put to practice what we say that we believe. All of us must keep in mind who we are and that we are the call of God and that we have been sent on assignment. We are on assignment here in this earth, and you have an assignment, and I have an assignment. And so I pray that all of us are equally as successful as God intends for us to be in our assignment. Everything, I want you to hear this, everything that God does has a purpose, all right? This storm was purposeful. This storm did not catch Christ by uh, uh, by what, uh, he did not catch Christ off guard. Sometimes I lose my focus in that, trying to figure out what word can best describe. And so y'all just pray for pastor in this regard. But listen, he says that, uh, get in the boat. He was already in the boat and did not long after them getting in the boat and leaving the storm comes and it did not bother Christ. You gotta ask yourself, if you're on the boat, if you can put yourself there, Christ said, let's go to the other side. He's already there. You take off. He immediately lays down and a storm come and Christ is not bothered. Now, if you say that you have the kind of faith that you and I declare that we have, would you think that you would not be bothered as well? If God is on the boat with you, why would you be worrying? No matter what happens, you win right? If, if, if all of you perish with Christ, if that was something that he allowed, you know that you have everlasting life. 
But you also have to have the confidence that God was not finished at this time. This is how I look at it, that he was not finished in doing what he came to do with the disciples. So the fact that they were fearful with Christ's presence on that, and he's modeling in an unspoken manner about what faith looks like. Don't be bothered by the boisterous wind that is blowing, that is speaking to you and trying to intimidate you. And don't be dismayed by the waves that are crashing up against you. Just look at me as an example of how you and I should respond to the storms that come in our life. So I want to make sure that I take the opportunity again to further define what, what a storm is. So I looked it up because I thought it would be interesting uh, to kind of put it in some contextual way uh, that we can kind of help frame what it is that God will, uh, that I believe God will help or hope that we will glean uh, from this teaching. Webster defined a storm like this. It is a violent meteorological phenomenon, right? And so it is a phenomenon where all of a sudden heavy rains and winds come out of nowhere. Sometimes you can predict it, but sometimes storms are, are uh, just kind of random and they can be uh, surprising. And sometimes, again, they can be predicted. And, but even when they are predicted, especially like a hurricane or one of those things that has the potential to be very uh, destructive, it is interesting to see that when that kind of storm comes, how people respond. Some people are very cautious. Some people leave. Some people don't pay any attention to it. And so I'm not going to spend a great deal of time in that, but I want to make sure that we understand that a storm is defined by a violent meteorological phenomenon. It is also known as a disturbance in the atmosphere. Oh, that'll preach right in itself because oftentimes that is what we are experiencing, disturbances in the atmosphere. And I'm so glad that God has disturbed my atmosphere and that he made me understand what it is that he was trying to do in my life, all right? And so it can be a tumultuous reaction, an uproar, or a controversy. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with the natural elements, but storm can be also a conviction or a condition in the human experience, right? You and I can become very angry at someone and just, just storm at them and just just have a, a volley of words and anger just kind of directed at a particular person. Or if you look at it from a war aspect, you know, storming the beach at Normandy, if you will. You know, the, the troops are coming in and getting ready to come up against the enemy. And so they're storming the beach. It is an assault, a frontal assault on the enemy. And so there are many ways to look at that. And I think that it's important for me to elaborate that because we need to understand uh, that what are the storms? What is it? We have to define that. Okay, what is this happening in my life? Okay, trouble seem to be coming down like rain. Sometimes it's a light rain. It's enough that you can handle. But every now and again, God will turn up to the intensity of the rain. And so it becomes a phenomenon. Have you ever been going through life and everything is going well, right? And uh, whatever it might be, you're enjoying life, things are success. And then out of nowhere, something major happens. And I know we typically use sicknesses in this in this time uh, in this explanation, right? So sickness sicknesses is normally what we default to. But sometimes it's not a sickness. It can be a financial thing, or it can be uh, a, a family uh, crisis, whatever it might be. Uh, the point is this: is that things are going well, and then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, you know, a phenomenon takes place. All hell, so to speak, breaks loose in your life. Right. And, and everything that you knew to be normal is now put to test. And in most cases, you're tasked, right? You're at your wits end trying to figure out how to hold on. And some people are not as successful as others. Some people have broke. You know, they were broken in this whole process, right? Uh, mental breakdowns, right? Emotional breakdowns. It happens when we have these unexpected events, especially if they keep happening and we have not appropriately addressed the previous one, or we lack the tools to help us through these process. And so sometimes it's about learning how to develop the right tools, uh, the inward tools, the, the tools of faith, right? Or, or, or correct thinking and processing things so that things are not crippling or uh, debilitating in our lives. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that I, that I stated that, right? So, but storms come for a purpose. Right, I wrote down storm help refines and sharpen our faith. That's the main premise from which I am sharing. That's the main premise for which I spoke even on this past Sunday. Having this understanding that storms come to refine and to sharpen our faith. Your faith cannot be developed 
without storm. And typically, we don't create the storm, right? We don't know how to do that. You and I can't create a storm enough, significant enough, to develop the kind of faith that God would have us to have in order to make an impact on behalf of the kingdom. Storms are the troubles we face. And as a result, it causes us, I want you to hear this again, storms are the troubles we face. And as a result of the troubles, we learn to trust God more and more, right? We learn to trust God more and more. And then our strength is developed, all right? And so I love the fact that God loves us enough to give us storms, right? It's like a parent, you know, if you're going to discipline a child, and I'm not going to uh, always use a corporal approach in terms of the spanking, what have you, but it may be taking things away, or it might be uh, putting some punishment on it, some acts that you have to, you make them do in terms of chores or working or abstaining from certain things. And it might be painful, especially if you are able to take what is really precious to your child and you take that privilege away and then you cause them to engage in other things that may cause physical rigor, right? Uh, you cause them to work labor or you may cause them to, uh, to have rigor in terms of their mental capacity, giving them work to do like schoolwork, whatever it might be. Right, those kinds of things. If you uh, if you use it, uh, uh, if you use it intentional enough and specific enough and purposeful enough, right, it can develop your child to say, you know what, I don't want to go through that again. Right? If you ever you ever went through a, a spanking or discipline process from your parents, especially those of us that are adults, and you say, you know what, that that did it. That was significant enough for me to state that I got the lesson. Right? I don't want to experience that kind of punishment or that kind of uh, uh, discipline again, right? So that's what I'm saying. And so with each of those experiments, whether it is a parent, you know, chastening a child or whether uh, it is God allowing certain things to come into our life, it is purposeful that we might be developed. And so all of us who have been in the Lord for any length of time should be able to look back and say, I'm a lot better off now than I when I first began. Because, and I, it is not really determined by the material wealth or the money that you have in the bank. It's determined about, about your ability to stay strong, to stand firm, right? It's about the fact that now when stuff comes in your life, you're not as quick to become unraveled. You're not running around frantically trying to figure out how is it going to uh, work out. You can say, listen, I've been this. I've been there, done that. I done had all of these trials and tribulations. And I recognize that the God that brought me out of the previous one is the same God that's going to bring me out of this. In fact, what I have learned to do is that, that now when I see a storm coming, now I'm more intentional in my prayer, specific about what I'm, what I'm praying about. Not, it's not now my prayers have changed from God, why, 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 to God, what is it that I need to learn? What is it that you want to perfect in my life? Where should I move? It's about becoming more seasoned in my prayer. And, and, you know, I have done enough counseling and been around enough people enough to recognize that a lot of us who are in the body of Christ seldom get to this place where we are uh, praying to God, where we're not crying out, God, why me, why me? But God, thank you that you trust me. Thank you that you are allowing me to experience what I'm experiencing. And now, God, give me insight and what it is that I am weak in, what areas of my life need to be strengthened? What is it that you want me to be developing? And, and what are you preparing me to do or to be? These are the questions that ought to be coming from the matured saints. And if you're not there, you need to trust that you can be there. And storms are the best way that God uses for us to get to this place. Right, without the trying of your faith, without the trying of your faith, you'll never get there. All right, yes, you got to go through the elementary stage where we lament and cry and we roll around on the ground, so to speak. But there come a point in time where that no longer happens. There got to come a point in time in the faith where you are standing flat footed and you're recognizing, let the storms come because God is working on me. Let the storms come because God is perfecting me and I'm not afraid. And whatever God chooses to allow in my life then it's going to happen. Some years ago, uh, I can remember uh, when I first came here at Emmanuel, I was preaching uh, from a series, a series about storms. And in that, I, I stated at least two storms that come to mind. And that's one, a storm of correction 
and a storm of perfection. All right. So those are, and then I'm going to offer a third one. That is the storm of direction. Right. So storms can come. All right. Storms can come to correct us. Storms can come to direct us. And storms can come to perfect us. Amen. And so when I look at this, Christ is on the boat. Let me read it. Uh, he says, a fierce windstorm arose and the waves, this is verse 37, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. All right. So immediately, we don't know the exact time. Winds come, water's rising up high. The boat, I can no doubt, was uh, rocking and reeling. And now it is taking on water. I can only imagine that they were thinking that we're going to sink and that we're going to die a horrible and a violent death. But Christ was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. He was in the back of the boat, right? He was in the back of the boat, and he was relaxed because I submit to you that Christ knew this was going to take place and that it was an intentional teaching moment on his behalf and that he was in control of the whole scenario. So let's look at what happened. So he says, they went back to the back of the boat, and here's how they uh, how uh, immature a young people in the faith. They woke him up and they said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're dying? We're going to die. They were fearful. They were fearful. Teacher, don't you care? We're going to die and you back here sleeping. If they had the reality that he was the Christ, the anointed one, if they truly believed that he was God manifested in the flesh, if they truly believed that he was God, Holy Son, then why would they bother waking him up? And why would they lament that don't you care that we're going to die? You know what? I don't like amusement rides in the sense that I don't like roller coasters. Yeah, I can remember when my when my children were younger, specifically my youngest one, uh, Elizabeth loved riding roller coasters. You know, uh, thankfully, uh, her sister, uh, Tesha, was one that I used to allow to, you know, encourage to go do in my stead. But I don't really like the fast roller coasters. So, uh, but I, I want to use this as an example. You know, here's a storm. They on a boat. I can only imagine how this ship is rocking and reeling and the waters are coming on. But if you know that Christ is the God, here's an opportunity to not be afraid, but to have the, the most thrilling ride of your life, up and down, going sideways and what have you, whatever, you know, throw your hands up. Wee, why? Because Christ is on the boat. Christ is on the boat. What's going to happen to us? If he's not afraid, then I'm not going to be afraid. If he's resting, then let me do what he's modeling. Let me sit back get a cushion and relax. I can only imagine if they would have taken that response. And how many of us today, even if it's symbolically, can take the, take the response, I'm going to rest and trust God. If God's not worried, I'm not going to worry. If God is in my midst, and I think that is where the disconnect comes, it's because when we're going through some of the life hardest challenge, we're not convinced that we have the right relationship with God the Father. But if you are convinced that you have the right relationship and you are convinced that God is hearing your prayers and that he's walking with you and that he is the orchestrator or he at least allows what is going on through your life. If you do have that conviction, then I was surmised that your faith or the example of your faith ought to look different from those who are yet uh, immature in the faith. All right. Confidence in the faith, growth in the faith means that we're less frail than unraveled. That we have learned how to trust God. And now God expects us to, uh, to be that for others who are around us to be able to say, hey, calm, calm down. It's going to be all right. God has this. I've been here. I've seen this before. And the Lord has brought me through. And that's a great time to share with young ones and other people who may need to hear that, how God brought you through it. All right? How did God bring you through it? So generally speaking, God, God does not reveal to us storms as they are approaching. He didn't tell them ahead of time, hey, go, uh, let's go to the other side, and soon after, a storm's going to come. Nope. Generally speaking, God doesn't do that. He doesn't tell us when a storm comes, and he doesn't tell us how long a storm is going to last. He just does not do that. But the fact that we know that he's with us, it ought to be comforting. This storm, according to verse uh, uh, 37 and 38, came out of nowhere, and the storm appears to be affecting the boat to the degree that they were fearful that it would at least sink, if not break apart. 
Jesus was unbothered in the storm, and the natural response of humanity is to be afraid. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? And I pray that if you are still living that kind of faith where that's your first response, then the desire for, from, for you is to grow and that you can get to a place where that's not even a part of your discussion. You said, God, I'm not sure what's going on, but I trust you. Then you said, now, Lord, help me to understand what it is that I need, need, to, uh, need to learn. Let me, let me finish up this teaching for tonight. I want to just read these latter verses because every time I read them, I just feel like, I feel like preaching it, actually. He says, teacher, don't you care that we're going, verse 39, that Jesus got up two things that was causing the fear. One was the boisterous wind, and the other was the waves two things that was causing them to be frightened, the wind and the waves. And so God, Christ's response was to address the very thing that was causing them to have fear. He says to the wind, silence. And he says to the wave, be still. Now, here's the thing. The reality is, is that they seem to be even more afraid by the fact that the wind and the way immediately responded to, to Christ's command, then they were of the wind and the wave destroying the boat. So that lets me know that they had no real earnest idea who was in their midst, who Christ was. Listen to their response. Where first, let me back up. Christ says, why are you fearful? Now, I want you to know, saints, that this is the purpose. That's why I know that this was a teachable moment because he was trying to develop their faith. Listen to what he says. Why are you fearful? Because you should have had faith, right? Why are you fearful? He says, do you still have no faith? This is the way the Holman stated, and I like the way that it's written here. He says, listen, I have created this teachable moment for you. I've allowed you to experience, and I gave you the assurance that it's going to be all right because I'm here with you. I got on the boat first. I'm sleeping on the boat. Now, here's the thing that really got me. Now, I hope that I am I am uh, seeing this correctly, and I'm not what we call isogeting a text. The, because if you go back up, it says, let us cross over to the other side, verse number 36. Uh, Listen to 36. This is central, I think. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was already in the boat. It says that other boats were with him. Now, the author could have chosen not to include what was happening with those boats, but just reading this, I get the understanding that the storm was only affecting the one boat that he and the disciples, Christ and the disciples, it was not affected. The, the text does not say that all of the boats were experiencing the, th the storms. Now, again, it could be simple. It could be that, that everybody was being affected. But for the purpose of what I'm trying to bring out is this, that, uh, that it seems to me that only the only boat that was being affected was the one that they were on. Now, let's just say that actually what happened. Can you imagine what the other people might have been looking at? Maybe they was close by and they can see an isolated storm assimilated, if you will, and watching this one boat going through all of that, and they are not experiencing anything. That's That, to me, is more exciting than, you know, the fact that all of them going through it. I don't know if they're making a difference, but I just thought that that was interesting enough that there were other boats with them, but the storm seemingly was only affecting the boat that they were on. And then Christ stands up and he says to them, why are you fearful? And he never, he never addresses anyone else. He never spoke in the plurality of it that other people are also going through this test. He says specifically to the ones that he handpicked, why are you fearful and and do you still have no faith? And I want to conclude with that. And I pray that God is uh, asking that question to you, but even more so, do you have faith? Do you still have no faith? And I hope and pray that for all of you who are watching that you can uh, claim to the Lord God, yes, Lord, I have faith right? But help my unbelief. When I fall short, I ask that you will help my unbelief. The only thing that they can respond to God, they didn't say to Jesus Christ, yes, God, we have faith. The only thing that they conclude that Mark says to us is that they ask the question, who then is this? What a great question. Who is Christ? 
that every demon in hell trembles at his name. Who is this that everyone who's called, who everyone who's breathed, everything that was created will bow before his presence? Because he's king of kings and he is Lord of Lord. And it's the king of kings and the Lord of the Lord that is calling and speaking to each one of us. They concluded that who is this that even the wind and the waves obey? The question is, is today that I'm asking you tonight, it's not so much whether or not the wind and the waves obey him. We've already been given examples and evidence that they do. The only question that needs to be asked is do you and I obey? Are you obedient to the Most High God, which is evident by your faith that you're not coming unraveled, you're not coming unglued, but you're resting in God. You know that he's your protector. You know, that no matter what he allows you to go through, as, uh, as the psalmist said in Psalms 23, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear because why? I have faith. I shall not fear because no harm would come to me because I am confident in knowing that my God has me and that my God is allowing me and that he never forsakes me that he's with me in everything that I can experience, except for the, even when I go through some sinful things. There are certain things that God does not condone and he detaches himself, but he never forgets you and I. He sends his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit convicts us and causes us prayerfully to come up out of our sins that we may keep that right relationship. And so I pray that this has blessed you, that the lessons from a storm is that your faith has been developed. Don't fight it. Don't be afraid of it. But let God do his perfect work. Allow him to perfect you. Allow those storms uh, to be beneficial. And the best way that I know how to do that is learning how to ask the right questions. Father, why is this coming? What is it that I'm supposed to learn? What should I do as a result of what is it are you teaching me? These are the right questions. Now, and, I, and I started with why the name. I was convicted actually right when I stated I don't want to just say why from the um, from the context of why me. That's that's immaturity. So I don't want you to ask, oh God, why? Because I always respond, why not you? What make you more special than anyone else? <laughs> We're all filthy rags in the eyesight of the Lord. So don't ask why me. Ask God, what is it that I need to learn? What are you doing? God, I'm open to your perfection developing the mentality that I belong to the Lord God and that God has a process yet developing in me. He has a purpose yet unfolding in me and that God is sending me through boot camp and various testing so that I may better carry his presence and that a world might see Christ high and lifted up in my life and that they may hear the praise of God upon my lip and that they may see me glorifying God with my life. Father, I thank you for each and every one that are listening. I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this opportunity, this privilege, Father, to teach you. I pray, God, that as the storms of life yet rage in our life, that we are uh, to a place in our life that we are mature. Father, I pray for these who are watching. Perhaps many have been in this cycle uh, of fear and this cycle of uh, this, uh, not learning. God, I pray that that will cease in the name of Yeshua the Christ. God, I pray that we will learn and that we will understand and that you will mature us, that we may become more like you uh, each and every day. Father, I pray that you will forgive us where we've fallen short. Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary. Father, we thank you, God, that you are forgiving, God, and that you're mer merciful and that, God, you are calling us to get back up because there's yet things to do and there's a calling upon our lives. And so, God, I pray that this reality is even more understood now through the teaching of the word. Holy Spirit, continue to minister right now to each and every person, every home, that they might see Christ, and that they may understand the purpose for which we are teaching and what it is that was released here tonight, that it may change their life, that it may mature them, that they may become more effective as a follower of Jesus Christ, that we can look like Christ and that we can be the express mirror that we carry his image, God. Let that be the result of each and every one that is listening. Father, let your peace continue to hold us and keep us, and let your purpose, God, continue to direct our steps, that you might get the honor and the glory. In the name of Christ, we pray. And so I pray that you know Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you don't, we invite you to do that by simply saying, Father, forgive me. I confess my sins before you. I acknowledge every wrongdoing, and I accept the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, my Lord.
Today I commit my life unto you. Fill me with your spirit, for I surrender. From this day forward, I'm yours. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said amen. If you made that prayer, let us know. You can uh, uh, direct message us or put it in the box that we may see who you are. Reach out to us in other ways that you choose to do so. You can reach out to us uh, via phone. Look on our website. We certainly want to hear from you. If you need a church home, this is a wonderful place to be a part of. You don't have to live in this area. Just let us know that you want to be a part of our manual family, even from a distance. And so we'll get the, the necessary information to make sure that you are connected to our ministry. Uh, we look forward to you joining us. The Lord says the same in prayer. Come and join us on a prayer call in the morning as, as we continue to do that. And certainly we look forward to you being a part uh, worship on Sunday. Amen. On Sunday, we are excited about what is going to come forth uh, through the preaching of the Word of God. I pray God's blessings upon you, and I look forward to you joining us again, not just in our worship Wednesday night Bible study, and also, also on our Wednesday noonday lunch hour. Amen. Pray the peace of God be with you, and may the joy of the Lord be your strength. Blessings for now. Take care.